Hi everybody, this is Laura and I'm going to answer a few short questions today on this video. I really became interested, I guess, if you call it interested in French history completely by accident. I noticed one of those kind of cheesy self-published books that you have all over the states about a certain community that someone had given my parents and it was a community that they grew up in and I noticed that Yes, my parents grew up in the same small community. It's it's true. I've got to admit to that. And I noticed that on my dad's side that there was a story about my ancestor, my great, great, great grandmother, Arabella Elizabeth Gallard. And I, the English pronunciation, I'm sure, is going to be Gallard. And I looked at it and I thought to myself, I thought that name looks French. I thought, well, let me look it up. I did a Google search. And once I did the Google search, I'm telling you, I just fell down a rabbit hole. And I had no idea that I had any French ancestors. I mean, I just assumed that I would, but I just, I couldn't think of anyone just offhand that I knew for certain were French. And I remember just being mystified and thinking, why in the, did you leave France? I mean, what is wrong with you people? You've got free health care. You can speak fluent French. I mean, who packs up and leaves France? Just, just cause. And my first thought was, oh, it must have been during the revolution. I mean, just imagine how bloody it is. And they probably, you know, it was just too da dangerous for them to raise their kids. And that just kind of made sense to me. But then when I went through and I started looking at dates and everything, and then I learned about the Huguenots. And I realized that my ancestors were basically the first wave of Huguenots who left France in 1685 when the Edict of Fontainebleau was decreed and which basically made being a Protestant illegal, uh, which basically means that not only were they devoted, they had enough money to get out of France, to smuggle themselves out of France, get to the English colonies, well, first get to England, and then get over to the colonies, which turned out to be South Carolina, and while I was researching, I, I realized that there's not that much information that they themselves personally have left behind. As a historian, you want to hear their words, their accounts, their feelings, their thoughts, their decisions, their struggles, and that way you document someone's history so, and their story so much better. And since I didn't have that, my training tells me then go to what we call the meta trends. Uh, what's going on in politics in France? What's going on in economics? What's going on in all these things that affect the entire country? It's not always just a single reason that someone leaves the language, leaves the country that they're born in and their language and their culture. And so I was introduced to the whole word of the Huguenots. I didn't know anything about them. I just assumed that if you were a, if you were a Protestant in France, you'd probably be a Lutheran. I didn't know that John Calvin was French. I didn't have the slightest idea. So that was part of my learning process. And I like to start with the encyclopedic kind of approach. And so I just went to Wikipedia and I thought, well, okay, well, who was king of France? Who were these people? Because I really, I, yeah, I, I didn't learn that much in a survey course. I didn't take a lot of graduate level classes in French because believe it or not, in middle Tennessee, we don't study a lot of French history. We don't, sorry. And I had to go through and start educating myself. And so I just went with something really easy with uh, Wikipedia. And I learned about Henry the II. Well, let's go back a little bit. About Francis the First, Henry the Second, Francis the Second, Charles the Ninth, Henry the Third, Henry the Fourth, Louis the Thirteenth, Louis the Fourteenth. All right, Protestants get out. So I, at that point, I just kind of had like a just general idea of what was going on and why my ancestors just either thought or evidence that they just couldn't stay there. They had to leave their home. And while I was doing that, I noticed people that I thought were very interesting. Um, for example, I knew that Catherine de' Medici had her female s spies, her flying squadron, the Esquadron Velon, the flying squadron. And I noticed Charlotte de Sauve's Wikipedia page, and I thought, that's a really fascinating person. And so many times in history, when you hear about women, and Catherine de' Medici is a wonderful example about that, they're derided. If they were powerful and if they had enemies, then yeah, they're kind of talked down. And Charlotte always referred to as the immoral Charlotte de Sauve. She had two lovers. She was just at her mistress, Catherine de Medici's beck and call. You know, basically she's a sex addict. I mean, come on. You know, Charlotte just one day decided she was just going to have sex with everyone she could, get some information. But once I started doing my research, I realized that Charlotte's story is a lot more complex than that. Her great-grandfather was executed 
for going to Francis I and telling him that Francis's own mother, Margaret of Savoy, was embezzling funds from Francis from the French treasury. And because Francis didn't want to have a split with his mother, Charlotte's great-grandfather was the one who took the blame, and uh, without going into too much of the story, he paid for it with his life. And that, to me, is a prime example of how difficult, how deadly it can be to serve in a royal court in any country. And for someone who's read a lot of Tudor history and a lot of, say, Philip Gregory and Jean Plaid and a lot of the writers who write about the Tudors, you really understand that when Henry got really emotionally unstable that it was literally deadly to serve at court, but you don't get money, you don't get titles, you don't get anything that allows you to live in the world, in the kingdom, without being in the king's favor, but the king's favor just facilitates back and forth and back and forth. So that was how I came to know Charlotte's story and went through, and my first piece about this era was writing a novel about Charlotte, and that's an editing process. And, and right now I'm going through looking for an agent, it's looking really good, and so hopefully I'll have some, some news quick soon on that, and you know, crossing fingers, crossing other fingers. 